will be the position of a safety mechanism. So what happens is our body has a safety mechanism in our body. Whenever there is some injury, some problem is there, a lot of times you will see about thought formation happens. So let's try to see in detail what tends to happen during the thought. So our presentation is divided into several slides. So this is the outline. We are going to talk about the challenges in clot management. So what is the new era, especially if you want to manage the clot? Then comes, especially in relation to a new molecule, this is a great news as well, I would say, especially for a country like India, where India is a cost-sensitive market. So, so what has happened is this molecule was a patented product, and now it has become generic. So what happens is to our own population as well, we can give them at really affordable rates. So what is our clinical experience with them? What do the guidelines say? And we'll also try to go further into details. So, I think we all have been using warfarin or the vitamin K antagonist since a long, long time. So like the acinocumarol, warfarin, accommodant derivatives in fact. So, but there are a lot of problems as well associated with that. So one of those problems, I think we all will agree, there are a lot of food interaction issues when we are trying to manage them as well, there are those INR fluctuations as well, there are interactions with the food as well. When we are trying to uh, do the dose adjustment as well, because we all have to take care of for the INR. So INR has to be there in the therapeutic rate. So that's why you, we all also have to see for this. Uh, this is not good. Uh, so about the dose adjustment as well. And of course, one of the biggest problems which comes is drug to drug interactions. So that's where the problem lies. So whenever we are using such kind of drugs, there's a lot of things to be desired. So what do we want? What do we want? Even as the physicians or the medical community people, or even from the sake of patient, what do we want actually? So that does that drug, first thing should be, it should be at least efficacious, if not, you know, uh, not worse than that. Second thing, the price should also not be too much as well. And what do we want is the cumbersome effect to be gone, which is the drug to drug interaction, otherwise even food to drug interaction as well. Then a very important parameter, which is safety profile. So for example, when a patient is taking that, the patient needs to be safe. There should not be some problem as well to the profile of the patient. For example, then similarly as well, it should not be happening. So when we are trying to give a certain dose of the molecule to a patient, we expect a therapeutic value as well for that. It should not be happening, for example, it happens especially with warfarin, that for one patient, we gave two milligrams, and then the INR went up to like two or three, but for the other patient, we have to give like, you know, even if we have given five milligrams of warfarin, still the INR is like one or two. So it is unpredictable, those responses as well. And of course, we want wide therapeutic window as well. So, so, so seeing all these problems, there has been a big research which has been going around and they all have been trying to find it out. So can we come across a newer, better molecule? So the answer has finally come, yes. So that is what is called as newer oral anticoagulants. So one of the first new NOAC which came up was Dabigatrim. And I must say as well, I, I really feel a bit lucky as well. Uh, uh, we have been using Dabigatron since a long, long time. I still remember way back in 2010 as well, when I was in the Netherlands. So it was almost like eight years back. We all were using this molecule. So we also tried to summarize our experience into this systemic review and meta-analysis. So with my yeah. colleagues from Australia, we tried to summarize uh, what are those good points and the bad points as well. How do they do in comparison to the gold standard of anticoagulation, which is Warfarin. So later on, when we wrote uh, and published it in the International Journal of Cardiology, we got a letter from the editor. The editor said it like this: "Look, now uh, this is 2014, so almost like four years back. They said it. The gold standard is changing. River Roxaban is there as well. You should try to do a comparative study, trying to include the River Roxaban as well. So in subsequent slides, you will try to see." We try to compare them as well. For example, one of the very important parameters is transient ischemic attack. So if you are seeing over here, 
I'm so sorry, the model is not working. So what happens is, even in this slide, this is what is called as forest plot. So in the forest plot, if you see it carefully, you will know which has an advantageous position, which doesn't. So similarly over here, so when we try to compare river rocks of ants versus white pink antagonists, it's almost similar. Even for the Navigatrin versus river rocks of ants as well, they are equally efficacious. So what about the other parameters? When we are trying to compare even strong molecules as river rocks of ants and Navigatrin as well, even on the parameters of thromboembolism or stroke as well, they are equally efficacious. I think being cardiologists or belonging to the medical profession, there are a lot of people as well who are working in the CCU and CAT lab. We all are very much interested in still doing those interventions. So what happens about the a complication which is pretty common, which is pericardial tamponade. So even over here as well, when we try to do the systemic review and meta-analysis of all these papers, what we saw was they are equally efficacious. So what about the other studies? As I already said, this was the first molecule which was available as an alternative to warfarin. And now, when we are standing in 2018, till date, we have the maximum experience with Navigatrin, in fact. So as I said, it, it does have all those good qualities as well. What happens is, it is easy to administer, fixed dosing, better efficacy, and of course, better bleeding risk as well. So definitely it is much more safer. So what had happened in 2008 itself, it was approved by the EMA, European Medical Agency. Europe is always ahead. That's what I have always noted as well. Let it be any kind of those molecules as well. And that's why we were lucky as well to try to use this molecule. And we found the USMC always follows that. And that's what had happened. So what are those indications? As I already said it uh, and shown you as well in my previous slides for the deep Thrombosis, systemic embolism, and also for the public. And especially, let's not forget our orthopedics colleagues as well. So, whenever they do all those uh, hip replacement surgeries or those major surgeries as well, they have a big role. So, oral anticoagulation is in fact the key. So, how do we determine which uh, anticoagulation to use? So, if a patient has come up with a uh, severe mitral stenosis or mechanical heart valve. We can try to follow this simple chart. If the answer is yes, we all know for valvular heart disease, we do not have much of choice. So, which is vitamin K antagonist or warfarin. However, if it is no, it is a non-valvular patient. So that is when we have to start thinking. So initially, we should assess the chart's last two scores, in fact, and then after that, if it is zero. We cannot, uh, we can think of giving nothing to the patient, in fact. But if the chance has two, the score is one, then we should think of, we may think of oral anticoagulation, but aspirin should be preferred. As I said, it, try to also look at the other comorbidities of the patient. Then similarly, how about the oral anticoagulation if chance has two, the score is more than two. If it is more than two, that is the time you must initiate the patient on anticoagulation. If you are not initiating them, it's a sin, I would say. And yes, if uh, still it is a contraindication, if you cannot initiate them on the anticoagulation, then you should also try to consider alternative therapies. So what are those alternative therapies are? Left atrial appendage occlusion devices. So as I already said about the various indications, now coming to the dosage. It's a very common question a lot of people they ask like which dose should be used for which kind of patients. So this slide beautifully summarizes actually. So one of the key things which we all need to remember is the renal function status of the patient as well. If the patient is renally compromised, having a renal failure and all, we have to go minimum, lower. And otherwise, yes, if the renal functions are good, so we can start thinking of starting anticoagulation. For example, for 110 mg. So as I had said it, so for prevention of stroke or even systemic embolism in the non-valvular AF patients as well. And as I said it, those other indications are the TVT, deep wave thrombosis as well for the pulmonary embolism patients as well. So.
Now, a lot of times it's a very common thing is, so if there's a patient who is on warfarin, if you're thinking of uh, starting uh, the patient from dabigatran, how are you going to initiate that? Anyone wants to try? Very simple, it's written on the flow chart. So easy thing is always, stop the warfarin as soon as the INR comes down to less than, that is the time you should initiate uh, dabigatran. And then, yes, as I said, one of the key questions always is the uh, renal function status of the patient as well. So that's why, I'm, so if the patient is renally compromised, the gap should be wider and a little bit slightly more wider as well. So, what if a patient is already on parenteral anticoagulation? So, the patient has this admitted over there in the hospital, and then you are thinking of switching over as well. So, as you can see it over here, the best thing is you can. Schedule it, uh, zero, give a gap of almost zero to two hours before the scheduled next dose, and you can start with the that gap. And the other thing is, uh, it's a, a very common question a patient is scheduled for surgery. So, what do we do? How much should be the ideal gap which we should be given? So, one to two days is the ideal good gap. And uh, the other thing is about this monitoring. How do we monitor the effect of dabigatran? So we have finally started the patient with dabigatran. So there are different parameters like APTT, the ECT, and even factor, uh, yeah, but factor 10A SA may not be so good actually. There are some reasons as well. So this is where the main difference comes for dabigatran when we are trying to compare it with the other NOACs, which is rivaroxaban, apixaban, and pidoxaban. So now coming to the clinical experience, there has been plenty of study which has been going around. This was one of the first study which tried to study the effect of uh, venous thromboembolism with dabigatran versus warfarin. Oh, so, so when they tried to compare on all the best parameters, I would say, those uh, really good parameters for the clinical success rate, or especially uh, taking care of the patient, in fact, something like the venous thromboembolism, or even for the parameters of major bleeding risk, or the intracranial bleeding, or even non-major bleeding as well, dabigatran was having an advantage. So there were several studies as well after that, which was a remedy study. So this study, again, proved the uh, <coughs> uh, dabigatran to be safer and much better molecule as well. Similar study was the resonate study. So even this as well, so there was much uh, significant difference. So one of the biggest turnaround came with Rely study. So what had happened in Rely study, it came in New England Journal of Medicine and it was one of the widest, biggest study as well. So in which was uh, conducted throughout 44 countries. 44 countries with more than 951 clinical centers. And when they try to look for the parameters of major bleeding, mortality rate, immunity rate as well, there was significant difference. So these are some of the other parameters as well. So one of the only thing which I would really say that try to be careful for if the patient has gastritis. So that is one of the parameters where you need to be careful. So this is also another patient. So for example, when you are trying to plan a PCI, percutaneous intervention, if the patient has atrial fibrillation. So there are two ways how to go about it. One is of course the triple therapy, and the second thing is uh, dual therapy, considering the dabigatran plus opidum rail plus ticagrelor. And even that as well, the arm which was receiving the dabigatran had a very much better clinical outcome. So there is a lot of indications as well, and that was one of the reasons when we are trying to look at those major uh, clinical guidelines as well, dabigatran came as a class one indication, in fact, for most of these recommendations, clinical situations. And that was one of the first, uh, as we all can see from its timeline itself, a lot of meta analysis has been coming up with time and time again, which has been proving its efficacy. So to summarize, warfarin is a good molecule, no doubt about it. But we need 
do have some better alternatives as well, which are NOAX, especially in a country like India, where we all have to be really price sensitive. So this is a wonderful molecule as well, and uh, having a good efficacious rule and much better safety profile in fact. So thank you so much. I'll be happy. Any questions?